Hello, and welcome to part two of chapter 14 on the liver. Where we had left off with part one was the end of this is what happens in normal liver function. And now for the rest of the uh, lecture, we're gonna be talking about when things go wrong with the liver. Fortunately, uh, the liver has fantastic regenerative capacity. Now it's not infinite, um, but the liver is really pretty good at uh, fixing itself. Um, acute damage to the liver because of uh, uh, drug exposure or uh, hep uh, hepatitis infection, uh, especially hepatitis A, this can be followed by recovery and regrowth. Uh, we can make more hepatocytes. In fact, um, this is the reason that we can have uh, living liver donors. Now, you know, you know, kidney donors, basically most people are born with two kidneys and uh, one can elect to donate one of those kidneys to somebody else. We don't have two livers, we have one liver, but it's, and, and people don't donate the entire liver, they take part of the liver um, and transplant that to somebody else. And then the, the the donor, um, it takes some time, but that liver, the cells of that liver can regrow um, and come back to full liver functioning. Uh, just really, really impressive. <laughs> Again, I know it's brown and blobby looking, but oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, the brain can't do that. Kidneys can't do that. Uh, so yeah, big fan of the liver. We have ways of assessing how the liver is doing, um, because as we've said, the liver can get damaged. Uh, similar to the troponin test um, that we did, it, it, we were checking somebody for damage to cardiac muscle cells. Remember, uh, cardiac muscle cells, when they die, they split open and there's something that a bunch of stuff gets released into the bloodstream, but there are particular markers that are unique to cardiac muscle cells, and that's what we look for in the blood. Same goes for the liver. Um, if there's damage to the liver to the point that some of the liver cells die and we have necrosis, some stuff's going to spill into the bloodstream. And uh, these are liver enzymes, what we call them, on um, these blood tests. Uh, the two that we hear about the most are ALT and AST. There's, this is the full name. I'm not gonna test you on the actual names of these things because we always just call them ALT and AST. Um, ALT is the most specific liver marker, um, but you'll see both of these reported. Then um, GGT, another enzyme, and in case you don't believe me about the enzymes, uh, ACE, remember, like lactase, um, th those are uh, the names of enzymes and in ASE. Uh, what did I want to tell you about that? Okay, um, different enzymes will be elevated uh, that might give us some insight into what is causing the problem. So for example, GGT tends to be uh, elevated um, when the damage is due to excessive alcohol intake. Uh, ALP can re reflect uh, cholestasis. Um, all right. Uh, so, so that's uh, liver cells dying and uh, we're looking in the blood for evidence of stuff spilling into the blood. These others are um, looking for evidence of the liver not quite doing its job anymore. And so we look for um, markers based on the fact that we expect the liver to make a bunch of proteins for us. So one of the things that um, the liver makes, as I've said repeatedly, is albumin. And albumin is the most common protein in the blood. And um, when the liver is not functioning well, it doesn't make as much albumin. And so we look for exactly how much albumin is in the blood. And that's gonna decrease with liver damage. The other proteins that de decrease uh, with liver damage are the coagulation proteins. Uh, those are the ones for clot the clotting factors. 
they're also going to decrease. But instead of counting like how much coagulation factors do we have, we actually look at the other look at it the other way. We say, okay, co coagulation factors are there to help us clot. So if we have less coagulation factors, that's going to take us longer to clot. And so that's what we look at is um, how long does it take to clot or the prothrombin time, the PT, and that's going to get longer. Uh, if it's just indicative that we don't have as many clotting factors as we had before. And then the third, um, uh, another way of uh, assessing uh, liver function is uh, assessing the, the kitchen capacity, um, specifically with bilirubin. Remember we talked about the how the unconjugated bilirubin or indirect bilirubin um, gets conjugated or made into direct bilirubin. If the liver is not functioning well, we actually get a buildup of this indirect or unconjugated bilirubin. And this other number goes, so the direct or conjugated goes down and indirect unconjugated go up. This is looking at the blood. Um, ah, when uh, liver damage goes on chronically, um, the, the, the liver becomes fibrotic. Um, and so we assess how much fibrosis there is. Uh, the non-invasive non ways of assessing it is with ultrasound, MRI, CT scans. Um, now the gold standard, like the most detailed um, is actually taking a biopsy of the liver, but that's a really invasive procedure. And so mostly we rely on ultrasound, MRI, CT scan. To changing topics a little bit, um, Let's talk about specific acute liver injuries. Um, more than half of the cases in this country are, can be traced back to a drug-induced liver injury. And acetaminophen is absolutely the most common culprit. The most common culprit. Um, it is, however, predictably dose-dependent. Uh, so you know, patients aren't supposed to get too much acetaminophen every day. Um, and if they do, most of us, most patients are gonna respond in this pretty predictable way that liver gets overwhelmed um, by trying to manage all of this acetaminophen. And so there's, there's damage. The, the more overdosed the acetaminophen is, the worse the damage is. So that's not surprising. Um, it, how can I say this? It's not that it's not important. Um, it, it's very important, especially given how uh, useful acetaminophen is and how common it is uh, to, to in, in this country. Um, the, the trickier thing though is other drugs, uh, including some antibiotics, that some patients will not have any problems. Their livers will have no problem processing this or processing this uh, molecule. No damage will, will occur. And then other patients, end up with severe liver injury. This is a, referred to as idiosyncratic, meaning it's unique to the individual. And so there are certain drugs that can cause liver damage, even though most patients won't get liver damage from it. And so we're on the lookout for, when we're giving patients medications, be on the lookout for um, signs of liver damage. And so some of the, the milder cases, uh, the, the symptoms are pretty, vague. Uh, they don't, the patient doesn't feel well, they might have some nausea, uh, but then if it's mild enough, it's going to resolve spontaneously. It doesn't, you know, no intervention is needed. However, in acute cases, one of the clearest signs right away is um, patients appearing jaundiced because of that elevated bilirubin. And that's, I mean, before you even do a blood test, you can start seeing the change in the color of the patient, especially in the sclera. Um, okay, so more liver damage or kinds of liver, kinds of liver damage or problems with liver, acute cholestasis. Um, that means that the bile is not flowing. It's being made, but it's not making it into the digestive tract. Uh, so there's blockage and this can be due to gallstones. This could be due to a cancer uh, or pancreatic inflammation. Uh, it can happen in response to certain medications. Uh, again, can be unique to the patient. Um, and uh, it's something that happens in pregnancy for some patients. 
as we've mentioned, jaundice is one of the clear signs uh, that you see quickly. Uh, remember, much of the bilirubin is going to go out in the bile. It has, and it has that intense yellow to green color. Um, if it doesn't get out in the bile, it's going to spill into the blood. And that's where that yellowing color of the skin comes from. Um, addition, additional uh, signs, uh, we'll look uh, at blood tests, elevated GGT and ALP. Um, ah, increasing in the, the circulating bile salts. So remember, it, going out in the bile is both trash and recycling. Um, so trash is bilirubin, but the stuff that is needed in the digestive system and it's gonna get recycled is the bile salts. Some of the bile salts, even though they're supposed to get recycled, some of that goes out in the stool. And so the amount of that, that gets recycled, it gets back into the bloodstream is manageable. If none of it's going out in the stool, it ends up being deposited in the skin and it can cause intense itch itching for the patients. And then finally, um, again, as we've said, the, um, the bilirubin is, uh, provides that really dark brown color to the stool. And so the, the stool doesn't get dark, uh, looks paler than usual, but because there's more bilirubin in the blood and more of it's coming out through the kidneys, the urine is gonna get darker. And again, it's due to the uh, failure in bile secretion. All right, now let's talk about hepatitis. Uh, that's a general term. Uh, itis, of course, means inflammation and hepa having to do with the, or hepato having to do with the liver. It can be acute or chronic, chronic meaning more than six months in duration. And it, lots of different causes. It could be uh, chronic alcohol exposure, um, obesity, some of the viruses, the three that we're gonna talk about and that's coming up next. Hepatitis A, uh, this one is uh, the one that's best known for fecal oral route of infection. This one, um, there can be outbreaks in daycare centers and restaurants. Um, somebody doesn't wash their hands uh, completely and it can get passed from one person to another. Uh, it's, an in it's an acute infection. It generally resolves. Uh, there is a vaccine available for this. Um, how it's diagnosed is looking for immunoglobulins against it. So remember IgM and IgG, those are the two um, immunoglobulins that uh, we have in you know, the primary response. First, we see IgM come up and then IgG comes later. Um, mostly once people have had hepatitis A, they're immune and um, they generally don't get sick from it a second time. Hepatitis B, um, it can have acute and chronic infections uh, are possible. The chronic part is it's a DNA virus and the DNA actually gets integrated into the host's DNA. Um, and so then the patient has it for life. It's treatable, um, but we cannot clear, we don't have a way yet to clear this infection. Uh, this one is bloodborne and is uh, sexually transmissible. There is a vaccine available for Hep B. It, you have to take it in three doses. Um, some people, even after taking it in three doses, they're they don't they're called non-converters. They don't become immune, um, and so they go through the series a, a second time. And again, if they don't become immune the second time, then we just say, okay, that's the best we can do for you. Uh, so yeah, vaccine development isn't perfect, but there is a vaccine. Um, it's just a little bit tricky to get uh, immune to this thing. And then finally, uh, hepatitis C. This one is bloodborne, also sexually transmissible. This one is so tricky because it can be asymptomatic for years. Somebody can have slowly developing cirrhosis. We don't know it until they're they have uh, severe uh, liver problems. Um, this is what contributes to you know, it being transmitted so readily because 
people don't know that they're infected. If uh, hep C goes untreated, it can progress to cirrhosis and beyond that in the small percentage of cases can lead all the way to uh, hepatocellular cancer. This is in fact, hep C um, is the most common reason for liver transplantation. Uh, I think three quarters of liver transplants are, are due to uh, having had a chronic hep C infection that went untreated. Testing for hep C is available. Uh, the recommended screening, weirdly enough, um, that there's one time screening recommended for the baby boomers, people born between 1945 and 1965. It turns out that most of these undiagnosed cases are in baby boomers. They had no idea that they had contracted um, hep C and they've been living with it for decades. Uh, it is screening, more routine screening is recommended for people with high risk behaviors, people who, for example, share needles, um, who are uh, sexually active uh, with multiple partners. Um, so yeah, screening is recommended. Unfortunately, there is no vaccine for hep C yet. Uh, fortunately, there is a treatment regimen that can completely clear uh, infections for many patients. Uh, it's expensive and it's long, but it, it's coming available. All right, let's talk some more about chronic liver disease um, and some of the vascular changes that we see. So when, when a patient has chronic liver inflammation, this can actually lead to hepatocyte death. Um, that it activates some of the fibroblasts that are in the liver called uh, stellate cells. Um, this results in fibrosis. That is, you're putting down scar tissue in, uh, in the liver tissue. That's gonna have some consequences. Um, one is the capillaries get more narrow. Uh, that's gonna increase the pressure in the, the capillaries. Um, but the cell, the endothelial cells get less leaky. So less stuff can pass out of um, the, those capillaries. So we have less permeability. So less stuff can get passed through. And that's what the liver is all about. It's passing stuff uh, from, the blood, from, from the blood into the liver cells and from the liver cells back into the blood. And that gets harder and harder to do. So as we lose the permeability, as we increase the resistance, um, what develops is increased pressure in through the liver and that backs up just like it did with the heart failure and you know the pressures backed up follow it backwards um, the, if the blood is having a difficult time flowing through the liver because of all of this fibrotic tissue that's going to back up into the the portal vein um, and that's what we call portal hypertension and that's got a bunch of consequences as we'll see Now, uh, liver cirrhosis in the early stages um, can be asymptomatic, but um, if, if the liver damage is sustained, um, it can proceed all the way to um, decompensation, in, in other words, when patients are showing symptoms. Uh, and that's, again, due to the extensive fibrosis and then the development of the portal hypertension. In the early stages, it can be reversible because the liver is so awesome at repairing itself. The hepatocytes can reproduce. And um, so if it's caught early enough, and so if the, the cause can be identified and addressed, so for example, if the cause is excessive exposure to alcohol and the person is able to abstain from alcohol, and I know that that is a lot easier said than done, um, but if they can, they may be able to recoup um, most, if not all of their liver function. Uh, if the damage is due to a hep C infection and it's identified and treated, again, if it's caught early enough, then that damage can be reversed. But if it goes on um, after a certain point, the, the damage is irreversible. You just don't have enough cells uh, that can replace themselves. And the fibrosis is in there and can't undo that. Um, and then in that case, if somebody is in this stage, then normal function, at least at present, um, can only be achieved by transplant. 
either from a living donor or um, uh, somebody who died. Uh, in late stage uh, cirrhosis, the liver becomes hard, gets smaller, becomes nodular in appearance. A healthy liver is kind of smooth on the outside, and this is not that. Okay, and that is the end of part two. And I will see you in part three. <laughs>